Let me read for you Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes this. He says, remember that you were at one time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, spiritually speaking, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Without Jesus, how much hope do we have? Big fat zero. But, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far from God have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, those of us who were far from God now know him. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you can know him because of what Christ did on the cross for you. Amen? Choir, thank you for reminding us of that. Are you all excited to hear from the word today? 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to keep going in our study of Paul's letter to Timothy, young Timothy, pastor at Ephesus. We said that this is a great book of the Bible for us to study because... The church at Ephesus was going through a lot of change when Paul wrote this letter. Is our church going through a lot of change right now? Yeah, just a little bit. And he was a young pastor of this growing church. And does our growing church have a young pastor who doesn't quite know a whole lot? Yeah, got a lot to learn, right? I've I've learned some stuff, got a lot to learn. I'm seeing that more and more and more every day, uh, including what we're going to look at today. Um, Now, I'll be honest with you guys. We have a lot of ground to cover in the Word this morning, so much that I'll be honest. Last night, I was thinking to myself, Ben, I don't know how how I'm going to get through it all. But then the Lord spoke to me through a Facebook post, right? (laughs) Karen Henry, thank you so much for this reminder. I get an extra hour today, folks, so I hope... (laughs) I hope y'all don't have a roast in the oven, because we are going to wrap up when I jolly well want to today, all right? That's, we got extra time. I'm going to make the most of it. All right, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. First Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at verses 1 through 7 together. We're going to keep talking about elders, the pastors, the spiritual leaders of the church. Read with me verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will, we, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We have a lot to look at today. Let's pray and ask God to teach us. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for... God, the fact that you have told us what to look for in church leaders. God, we're not just supposed to pick the most popular person. We're not supposed to just pick the brightest guy in the room. Lord, you've, t- you've told us what character qualities matter most when it comes to leading in your church. And so as we examine that today, God, I pray that you would help us all to look at our own hearts and our own character and our own integrity. Lord, are we, are we people like this? Are we people like Jesus? God, would you help us today, Lord, to look at your word? And t- God, I pray that you would show us where we, where we need to change and give us grace to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me give you a little recap because we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Uh, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at godly church leadership. And, and what we've been saying is that uh, we, we've been saying that Jesus is the head of the church. We all know that. But there's a couple of important leadership positions in the church. You've got the elders who are the spiritual leaders of the church. That's what we're going to talk about today. And they see to the spiritual needs of the church, things like pastoring and praying and training and discipling and teaching the Bible, one of the things that's mentioned here. You also have deacons as well. They see to the physical needs of the church. 
And so they're doing things like serving and benevolence requests and visitation and making sure that there's, there's food in cupboards and making sure that, you know, we've got a ramp ministry, for example. If somebody's injured and can't walk up the stairs, we have a crew of guys that goes and builds ramps for people. And so we've got these two positions, and God designed it this way because he didn't want too much weight on too few men's shoulders, right? We've said this. We said that the spiritual leadership, that's a heavy weight to carry. And the physical needs of the church are very important too. Does God care about your physical needs? Absolutely. And that's a huge weight to carry. And God separated them because it can become too much. So we've talked about a biblical church leadership structure. Now we're looking at the need for godly church leaders. Now, last week, what we, we, we talked about was what does an elder do, right? What does, what does a pastor, one of those spiritual leaders, what does an elder do? And we said five things, right? We said they pray for the flock, they feed the flock, or in other words, they teach the Bible, they train the flock, they protect the flock, and they lead the flock. That's what we talked about last time. If you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at that. That's what you can expect of me. That's what you can expect of the associate pastor that we're going to be hiring. That's what you can expect of the spiritual leaders in our church. Now, today, what we're going to look at is not what an elder does, but the kind of character that an elder needs to have. It's not just important what an elder does. What matters to God is what an elder lives like. God doesn't care so much about the work an elder has to do as much as he does about the character an elder has. And so when we look in the Bible here, we're going to see in verses 1 through 7, 15 characteristics, 15 character qualities that an elder, a spiritual leader needs to have in order to be qualified to lead. And I want you guys to see there's no college degrees here, right? We're not talking about the guy who's the most popular or the guy who's the most articulate. We're not talking about the guy who's best in business. We're talking about character, godly character. And here's why. Church leaders are not appointed to leadership because of what they can do. They're appointed because of who they are. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I'm going I'm to shoot very straight with you from the very beginning today. Our church, as, as long as we appoint godly leaders, is in safe hands. But the second we turn leadership into a popularity contest, or I want to get my buddy onto the deacon board, or I want, to, I want to get this person into a position of influence because of what they can do for me. Listen, the second it, it becomes about anything other than character, we're in big, big, big trouble. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over again. Character matters. So here's the, here's the questions we're going to look at today. How does an elder live? Or in other words, why does this matter? What are the character qualities you can expect from me? When you look at my life, what should you be able to see? When you look at your deacons, what should you be able to see? Pastor search team, when we look for an associate pastor, we're not looking at their GPA. We're not looking at whether or not they've got a certain spiritual gift. We're looking at, first and foremost, their character. Now, men, remember, we've said already that you're the elder in your home, right? Men, you're kind of the pastor of your house. So, men, what kind of character should you aspire to have? What should your wife and kids be able to see when they look at your life? This is a big deal. And at the end of the day, we should all be shooting for this, right? Just because you're not an elder, just because you're, you don't have some certain responsibilities, doesn't mean you get to take a day off of being godly. So we should all aspire for this. Every one of us, as we walk through this, can look at our own hearts. Now, there's a danger here, and I'm going to start off with a little story. The danger is that this is one of those passages with a lot of lists, okay? I mean, we read a lot of words here in verses 1 through 7, right? Who knows what pugnacious means? Anybody looked that one up in a dictionary recently, right? Like, there, this, this is a lot. This can be overwhelming. It's kind of like a trainer with a lion. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but when lion trainers go into the cage with a lion, they carry three things with them. They carry their pistol, last line of defense, right? They carry their whip try to keep the lion at bay. And then they carry something that you wouldn't expect. They carry a stool. Normally it's got four legs on it, a four-legged stool. And what the lion trainer does is when the lion starts acting up, when it starts getting rowdy, the lion trainer will take the stool by its seat and they will shove it towards the lion's face. And they keep doing that and the lion will calm down. And here's why. 
As the trainer shoves the stool, all four legs at that lion's face, what happens is the lion tries to look at all four legs at once and it becomes overwhelmed. And immediately it doesn't know what to focus on. It's like, wait, which leg should I be biting at? What should I be looking at here? There's too much going on. And brothers and sisters, listen, this is the danger we have when we come to a passage like this. We're going to look at a lot of character qualities today and it's going to feel overwhelming at first. Can I just be honest about that? As I studied it this week, this was overwhelming. But let me remind you, you really have one thing to focus on. So, so leaders, listen up to me here. Men, listen to me on this. All of this, every single character quality we're going to look at today is this. Be like Jesus. Okay? If you focus on that one thing, you'll get all these. Right? If, it's like the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Right? If you try to focus on love and joy and peace and gentleness and patience and long-suffering and self-control and all of those things, you can get overwhelmed. But, but here's what God's trying to say. Just let the Holy Spirit lead your life. In the same way, today, what we're going to look at is just let Jesus lead, lead your life. And here's the character quality you can expect. So here's what we're going to look at. Here's the character qualities. Let's look at the first five today. You can write them down if you're taking notes. First and foremost, verse 2, an overseer or an elder must be above Reproach. Now, this is kind of the umbrella term. This is the term that literally just handles all the rest of them, all right? Literally, in the Greek language, it means hands off, okay? So, so what we're saying is the elder, the spiritual leader, their character needs to be hands off. Or in other words, when somebody hurls an accusation against a godly leader, their character should be so sound. They should have such impeccable integrity that nobody could put their hands on them. It should be so clear that, nope, that guy didn't do that. That guy would never talk like that. I know that's the rumor going around, but he would never act like that. He would never do that thing. Have you ever heard, known somebody like this? Somebody with such great character that they just, a, an accusation can't stick. God love you, sweetheart. No, you're good. Now you're happy. So number one, brothers and sisters, the elder, the godly leader, the spiritual leader needs to have an, an integrity such that if somebody hurled an accusation at them, nobody would believe it. Can that be said of you? If there was a rumor, a false rumor floating around town about you that made you look bad, would people believe it? Or would they look at, that, at your life and say, there's no way because I know the character that they have. And that starts at home. That's why he starts off here with the husband of one wife. Now, there's some context here because back in this day, there was a lot of polygamy, okay? A lot of the guys would have multiple wives. And then in addition to that, when they went to worship at the temple, there would be all sorts of promiscuous practices with temple priestesses and, and all sorts of stuff there. And so what Paul's saying is they've got to be the husband of one wife. Or in other words, they need to be a one-woman man. That's what the Greek language literally says. They need to be faithful to their spouse. Why? Because if I'm not faithful to my bride, I'm not going to be faithful to Jesus's bride. Does that make sense? I got to be faithful there first, and then I'll be able to be faithful here. If I'm running around on her, you better believe I'll be looking to ditch you guys right? I don't love you near as much as I love her, and y'all ain't as cute, right? So, so the idea here is you got to be faithful to your spouse at the house, right? And then you're, then you're able at that point, the spiritual leader is able to be faithful in the home. If he's abusive to his bride, he'll be abusive to Jesus's bride. If he's loving and compassionate and caring and gentle with his bride, he'll be loving and compassionate and gentle and caring with Jesus' bride. That's why when we look at an associate pastor, let me talk to the search team for a second, we're going to get to know his wife too if he's married. And we're going to watch them together because the way a man treats his wife is the way he'll treat the church. And we're going to talk to her, how is he in the home? Because what a man's really like, you'll see in the home. I've seen a lot of guys fake it in church. I've never seen a wife come up to me and say, yeah, I'm, my husband just listens to me so well and he's so caring and he does the dishes, but he's faking it. No, no wife says that because what a man is in his home is what he really is, right? So that's how you get to learn about this person's character. He's got to treat his wife well. Now, there's a couple of others here in the next verses. So he, it says at the end of verse 2, he's got to be temperate, prudent, and respectable. These three kind of go in, hand in hand. And let me write down a word here that you can write if you're taking notes. Really, the idea is self-control. Self-control. 
So the idea here is temperate, prudent, respectable, all of that's kind of getting at the same thing. This man is in control of his passions and his desires, okay? Right? And this is important, right? It would be hard for you to respect me if I had a horrible anger problem, right? If I'm out working with my weed, wha weed whacker and, and like, you know, the string gets stuck and I'm just beating it up against the house and you're driving past, you're thinking, I don't know if I want to listen to this guy on Sundays, right? <laughs> you're driving into church and my family's walking over and I'm screaming at my wife, right? You ruined dinner last night. Well, you're going to look at me and say, I don't want that guy to teach my husband how to be a husband. I don't want him doing the finger thing to me. Right? If we go out to lunch to George's today and I'm screaming at the waitress because the meal took too long, like it did the last time I went there. <laughs> Haven't been back, still bitter about it, okay? <laughs> but if I'm screaming at the waitress th this afternoon, y'all are going to be looking at me like, dude, my pastor's a maniac, okay? I don't know that he's fit to lead me spiritually. He doesn't have himself under control. Right? And so the, the idea here is, is the pastor able to control himself, not just with anger? What about impulses? Does the pastor have to eat everything that's put in front of him? One of the biggest problems I see among pastors is that they're overweight, they're gluttonous. I'm serious. There's not a lot of pastors that are in good shape. Now, some of y'all are to blame for that because I've put on 15 pounds since getting here, all right? Make some nasty brownies, burn some pie, help me out a bit, okay? But you got to have self-control. Here's the next few for you. Keep on reading with me. End of verse 2, we see temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. So hospitable. You know, I've never met a good Christian leader who didn't like people. Now, I've met a lot of introverts who are good Christian leaders, right? I'm not saying you got to be an extrovert, but I've never met a good Christian leader who didn't like people and wasn't excited to be able to spend time with them. Leading and leadership positions are about people, not projects. And so when we hire an associate pastor, yes, he'll have responsibilities, but his number one responsibility, pastor search team, is people. And if he doesn't like people, he didn't qualify. So if his focus is going to be on youth, we're going to get him together with the youth group and we're going to watch him hang out with the teens. And if he's scared to talk to them, he isn't coming. If he doesn't like them, well, he's not going to be here. Because to be a Christian leader, to be a godly leader, you've got to like people. You've got to want to spend time with them. Is this person willing to open up their home? Are they willing to be hospitable when people need to come into the office and they've got a lot going on? Are they able to put stuff down and close their computer screen and get off their phone and look you in the eye and listen to you? If they're not hospitable, if they're not good with people, then they're not fit to lead. A shepherd needs to be able to be around sheep. And a pastor needs to be able to be around the flock of Jesus Christ. Here's the next one, able to teach. Now, this one right here, you can put a star next to, whoops, that's my hand. You can put a star next to this one. Able to teach is the one thing Paul mentions in this pastor, passage that is not character. Everything else is character. This is the one thing he says you need to be competent at. This is the one thing you need to be able to be good at doing. So when we hire an associate pastor, that person's got to be able to explain this book, especially if they're working with our youth, because I don't want some guy in here teaching our youth stuff that's not in this book. And parents, I know you don't either. My, my prayer, my plan is that by the time a kid leaves this church at 18 and goes off to college or the military or enters the workforce, that they're able to stand on their own two feet mature in Jesus Christ. Not perfect, but they know what this book says and they're equipped to live it out. That's going to take a man who can teach. We're not hiring somebody because they are good at administrative skills. We're not hiring somebody because they can work PowerPoint or run a soundboard. We're hiring somebody at this point who can teach. And listen, all the, all the lay elders that we might have at this church, as we talk about some of these leadership changes, all of those men must be able to teach. Not saying they have to all the time, but they must at least be able to. Now, verse uh, number eight and number nine kind of go together here. So if you take a look at verse three, it says, not addicted to wine or pugnacious. Some of y'all probably have a better word than that. I had to Google that one, all right? I don't know if y'all have used that in a sentence lately. Here's the idea. This individual, the spiritual leader, the, the phrase not addicted to wine, in the Greek language, what it literally means is not near wine. In other words, the more I've studied this passage, 
the more I've come to the conclusion that the elders, the pastors, the spiritual leaders should not consume alcohol. Now, what you'll see is that's not the same thing for the deacons, okay? Deacons have to drink in moderation, and I think that's the, that's the expectation for all. Some of you have a conviction, you don't touch alcohol. Praise God for that, don't touch it. Some of you have a conviction that it is okay to consume alcohol in moderation, and I think the Bible allows for that. The one thing the Bible says is not okay with alcohol is drunkenness. So if you start getting buzzed and you're not under the control of the Holy Spirit, if you're under the control of some other spirits, if you know what I mean, you're in trouble, all right? All right, don't go there. And if you can't handle that, don't touch it. I've looked through the Bible on this. There's almost 200 warnings in the Bible about using alcohol. I've never seen it encouraged. I've read the Bible cover to cover. God never encourages it. I think he allows it. He never encourages it. And some of y'all need to stay away from it. I'm just going to be honest with you. You're letting something into your life and maybe even into your home that's not good for you. Some of you can handle it in moderation and enjoy a good gift from God, but I think that's very few. As for the elders, I think this verse seems to indicate, especially if you look at it in the original language, that they should not go near. Now, why? Well, what if last night I was hanging out at Bragging Rooster just throwing them back and you all walked in? All right? That would look a little different. What if some of the teens came down and I'm just kind of, I'm okay, but I'm kind of wobbly, you know? Not good. It's not a good look. It's not a good example. I've got to be under the control of the Holy Spirit at all times. And what that means, I think, according to this is, is you don't go there as a pastor. And so one of the things I would encourage us to think about is when we hire an associate pastor, having a, a basically a, a job description line in there that says they don't consume alcohol. Again, I don't think that's a standard for deacons in the Bible. We'll see that next week, actually. But as for pastors, and this is one of the reasons I don't drink. Some of you know I used to drink, right? I grew up in Scotland. They got a lot of whiskey, okay? I used to drink. Um, I don't drink now because I want to constantly be under the control of God. And I think that's a good way to look at it. I want you to constantly be under the control of God. So if you can't handle that, walk away. I will say this. In the, in the two plus years that I've been at this church, I haven't missed it. God's taken good care of me. I've been just fine. I've been plenty happy, right? You don't need alcohol to have a good time. So now pugnacious here literally means not a fighter. So what does alcohol make you want to do? All right, bring it on. Were you talking about my wife? Right, and then you start throwing down in bragging rooster, right? So not only can I not go in, I can't get in fights there either, okay? And this is the same thing. It's not just, not just when alcohol is controlling you, but you cannot be a fighter, in fact, the, one of the next ones that we're going to see here is peaceable. You see number 10 is gentle. Number 11 I've got here is peaceable. The pastor, the spiritual leader, is not somebody who handles their problems and their conflict with fists. That wouldn't work. If I'm out here on a Sunday morning screaming and throwing down with a police officer who pulled me over because I got a taillight out, that's not a good look, friends. That's a scar on the name of Jesus. So we don't handle our problems as spiritual leaders by throwing down or by getting into fisticuffs or going toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody. No, the pastor is somebody who needs to be able to take an insult the way Jesus took an insult. All right? First Peter tells us that he was reviled, but he didn't say anything back. And he gave us an example of how to suffer like he suffered. Jesus didn't go fighting people. In fact, the only people you could say he got ticked off at were church people. Remember the temple? Sitting there making a whip like Rambo, flipping over tables, right? That's because they weren't worshiping properly. They were taking advantage of God's people. But Jesus never, never became violent. He got angry, appropriately angry sometimes, but he never became violent. And the pastor can't either. Number 12 is not a lover of money. That's at the end of verse 3. Literally, it means free from the love of money. One of the pastors that I've worked with in the past, um, church gave him a job offer, gave him every penny that they could afford. He came back and said, I want 15 grand more and a better insurance policy. Do you know that? That didn't go very well. They hired him anyway because they were desperate. When he got there, he wanted the nicest MacBook computer you can possibly imagine, went down to the local furniture store and spent over three grand on furniture just for his office. And that's not good. 
Now, I want you guys to see this. He's free from the love of money, right? Some of y'all are like, that's me because I'm broke, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's free from the love of money, not just free from money. The Bible says later in this book that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's okay to have money. The question is, how much of you does money have? How focused are you on money, on, on buying the next best thing, right? Are you up to your eyeballs in debt because you can't handle not spending? When your paycheck comes in, do you already have half of it spent in your mind because you just can't wait to keep up with the Joneses and get that next best thing? Is your life about money? Now, money is important. Money is a tool that we have, but we need to be wise. We're not a lover of money. We're a lover of Jesus, right? And that should be clear. When you look at me, you should see that I love Jesus, not money. And that's why I've never and I will never ask for a raise at this church. You all have been generous and offered them, and I will accept them at times. Sometimes I won't. But I will never go to the budget committee and say, I'm going to need more money here. No, I'm going to learn to live on what God provides. And I'm going to trust him to give you wisdom as to what that number looks like. Because money's not a factor. Every pastor should be in that boat. Every spiritual leader should be in that boat. Number, number 13, manages his household well. In other words, men, understand this. Your home is your first ministry, right? Your home's your first ministry. If I am screwing up with my wife and my little girl, then I come in here and say, but I'm putting in a lot of hours at the church. That's wrong. If they're suffering so that I can do more here, that's wrong. My first ministry is to my family. Men, this is for every single one of you. Your first ministry is not to your job, guys. Some of y'all live like it. Your first ministry is not to your hobbies or to hunting or fishing. And some of y'all live like it. Your first ministry is to your family. It's to your wife. It's to your kids. So make sure. And, and by the way, can I say this? I've had, I've had a few wives come up to me this week. All right? Some of y'all are nervous right now. I've, I see some, some of the men just squirming a little bit. I've had a few wives come up to me this week and say, Ben, my husband started praying with me like you told them to. Dude, do you know how much that pumps me up? I'm serious. And like, look at like, some of your wives saying like, I've been praying for that. Right? I, had, I had a wife come up to me and say like, my husband prayed for the kids when he dropped them off at school and they came back and told me, do you realize how much your kids need that from you? Dads, step up to the plate. I'm proud of those of you that have. That, praise God for that. You don't have to get it all right away, but start somewhere. Start reading the Bible maybe after dinner together. But men, your first ministry is to your family. God expects you to tend to the spiritual needs of your home. I've told you this before. So that means if your wife has spiritual needs or your kids have spiritual needs that are not met, what that means is God's going to hold you responsible for that. He's going to hold you accountable. And listen, some of you ladies in the room, you're blessed because you have a man who leads you spiritually. Thank him for that. And some of y'all are struggling right now because you don't. And pray for him. Encourage him. Help him lead you spiritually. This is really, really important. Our first and foremost ministry is to our, to our homes. Now, this is also really important with kids. Preacher's kids aren't perfect, okay? My kid's not going to be perfect. Shucks, I'm, <laughs> I'm a preacher's kid. One time I got grounded for a whole year, okay? <laughs> I was a bad candy thief. I was a really bad candy thief, okay? Got grounded for an entire year. Trust me, I wasn't perfect, and, and my kid's not going to be perfect either. But what you should be able to see in me and in Kara as, as we parent is that we love our daughter and that we have appropriate control over her, that she's disciplined in love when she steps out of line because God, our Heavenly Father, disciplines us in love when we step out of line, right? That when she falls down and she is discouraged, that we help pick her up and encourage her because God, our Heavenly Father, does that for us. You should see a picture of God, our Father, in the way I father my child. And men, that goes the same for all of you. Do you love your kids the way your father loves you? That's a big, tall order. Do you see how overwhelming this can be? But we've got to manage our household well because if we don't take care of that home, we're not going to take care of God's house. Our house comes first. Here's the last two. Not a new convert. or In other words, you don't make somebody a pastor or an elder if they just got saved. Why? It says here in the passage. Take a look with me 
at verse 6. It says, not a new convert so that he will not become conceited or prideful and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. So what did the devil do? How did the devil fall? He looked at himself. He got puffed up and he said, wow, I'm a big deal. I'm hot stuff over here. In fact, I'm such cool stuff. I'm going to take on God. I don't need God. I can be God. That's what Satan said. And listen, I've seen this a bunch of times. When you put a young guy who's only recently converted to Jesus or a, or a man who's only recently become a Christian in the position of elder, they can look at themselves and say, wow, I've only been saved for two years. Look at how far I've come. Look at me. I'm really getting somewhere. And they can become prideful. And pride comes before a fall. And guess who's wrapped up in that fall? All the people that he leads. So he says, not a new convert, lest he fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. Verse 7, last one, he must also have a good reputation with who? Those outside the church. So not just church people need to like him, even people who don't love Jesus, people who don't worship with us, people who curse like sailors and drink like truck drivers. I pulled that one out of my hat. You would know, Jimmy, right? Don't drink and drive. You're a truck driver. You didn't do that. Even, even the roughest of the rough need to have respect for these individuals. And, and, and this is where I'm going to... I don't see him in there. There's Ricky Young. Ricky, I don't know that I've ever told you this, brother. When I first got here, I, I was maybe here for about six, seven months. I met a man, and I told him I was a pastor at Macon Baptist Church. And he said, oh, that's where Ricky Young goes. I said, yeah, yeah, he's one of our deacons, actually. And here's what the man said. He didn't know anything about our doctrine. He didn't know anything about how many people we had, didn't know anything about our ministries. He knew nothing about this church. But here's what he said. If Ricky Young goes to your church, you got a good church because Ricky Young's a good man. He didn't need to know what we teach about the doctrine of sanctification or whether or not we're Calvinists. All he needed to know is Ricky Young goes here. If people knew you went to this church, would that make them think more of the church or less of the church? I hope it would make them say, wow, I, that must be a good place to worship. The elder, the pastor, needs to have a good reputation. In fact, that's why a lot of churches, when they get elders, they'll actually put an ad in the paper. And they'll say, these are the folks that are up to be elders at our church. If any of you have an issue with them, call our church and let us know. And they'll let the outsiders weigh in on who's elders because they have to have a good reputation with those outside the church, not just those inside the church. This is a lot. And this is what God's calling our spiritual leaders to. This is what God calls me to. I hope you can see this character in me, not perfectly, but I hope you can see this in me. We're gonna look for this in your, your associate pastor. We won't hire a guy that doesn't have this. As we talk through elders and deacons down the road, we will never appoint a person as long as I'm the pastor of this church who doesn't have this kind of character. It's not about whether or not they voted for the political candidate you like. Ben, what if they're, what if they're not all that smart? Doesn't matter. Ben, what if they're not all that good looking? Doesn't matter. Ben, what if they wear dumb ties to church and sing Taylor Swift songs? Doesn't matter. What matters is their character, their heart. If they're a man after God's own heart, like Jesus, they're good in my book. So men, this is the character we aspire to have. Look at your heart, is this you? Ladies, even though the role of elder isn't open to ladies, this is the character you aspire to have. I hope that you're this kind of mom if you have kids, or grandma if you have grandchildren. I hope you're this kind of coworker. I hope you're this kind of witness in our community that every single one of us has a good reputation outside of this church. Because God puts character before what we do for him. That's why, by the way, Mary and Martha are recorded the way they are in the Bible. Do you guys remember that story? Martha was doing all the work. She was rushing around, serving, getting the table set, cooking the dinner, getting the pie out of the oven. Where was Mary? sitting at Jesus' feet, sitting with the king. And then Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, Martha, that's his way. That, that's his way. If, he was a, if he was a southerner, he would have said, bless your heart, <laughs> right? He says, Martha, Martha, 
Mary's got it right. Mary focused on her character, her time with Jesus. Martha was focused on what she was doing. Don't focus on what you do, men, as much as you focus on who you are. Get that right, the rest will follow. And that's true for every single one of us, amen? So let's pray God makes us this type of person. We're never going to get it perfect because there's only one who got it right. Who's that? And, and praise God, brothers and sisters, on the days we fall, Jesus didn't fall. The days we screw up, Jesus never screwed up. He got it perfect, and he died on the cross in your place, in my place, so that while we can strive for these things, we don't have to beat ourselves up or be afraid of God when we do fall down. We can pick ourselves up and keep going. Amen? So let's pray God makes us this kind of church. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that character matters more than what we do. So God, I pray for every single person in this room. Lord, would you help us all to have this kind of character? Lord, would you help me? God, you know it hit me in a fresh way this week, just the, the weight of getting this right, of being an example to these people, my friends, and showing them a little bit more of your character in the way that I live. God, would you help me with that? God, I pray for the associate pastor we, we plan to hire. We don't know who he is yet, but I pray right now, even right now, that you'd be working this character in him. Make him a godly man, Lord. We'll be able to work with whatever else. Lord, would you bless this church? Would you bless us all to have a good reputation outside of here so that we can point people to Jesus and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, especially in this time where we have so much political divide? God, would you help us to be those who have the character necessary to bring people together and point them to Jesus? In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen.